All right, we are live. Thank you for joining us today. Today I am joined by Mel from the Origins channel, looks into the historical origins of Islam, kind of putting aside the standard narrative and asking what do we actually know historically. Perhaps when we dive into the history we'll discover that the Muslim historical sources are pretty accurate. That's a reasonable starting position. But when we actually look at it, we found something very different. And Mel's going to be talking a little bit about that today. Let me go ahead and open us with a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the technology that allows us to connect with fellow Christians, but also non-Christians from all around the world. We pray that this stream will reach many Muslim minds, that it will, that they will not just dismiss what we have to say, but will ask these important questions. If Islam is actually true, then they have nothing to be afraid of. And if the historical narrative has been invented and is false, then they should want to know that as well. Uh, in principle, they should want to get back to the original teachings of, of Islam, if such a thing really exists. And if Islam proves to be completely false, then they should want to know that and find a different religion than is true. We pray that uh, people approach the material with an open mind, whether they are Christians, Muslims, or otherwise, and not simply dismiss what we have to say. We ask that you be with us today, that you guide our discussion and prevent us from grave theological error. We ask that anything that we say that is true and useful be remembered and applied, and anything that we say that is false is simply forgotten. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. As I said, I'm joined by Mel, and I'm going to give him uh, some time to introduce himself, tell us a little bit about what he does on YouTube. Okay, so I'm Mel. Um, I'm originally Mel of Sneakers Corner, but I started a new channel recently called Origins. I thought the name was more fitting. In fact, the name that should be underneath me there should actually say Origins, not Origin. But um, yeah. Um, so the, uh, the the key aim of my channel is basically to delve into the origins of Islam. I don't accept the standard Islamic narrative or sin, as, as it is often known as. And what I'm asking are just basic evidential questions, which is, okay, if the narrative says this, does that correspond to what we find in historical sources? And what typically happens is we find contradictions. And these contradictions should not be happening because if the narrative is true, we should see a consistent message in the general narrative, the general evidence from history from the time. But what we find is no matter what angle or area that we look at, we constantly come up with contradictions um, and it doesn't make sense. And um, this phrase, it doesn't make sense, is something that we'll hear a lot today because we're going to see lots of examples of how things don't make sense. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to just share my slides here. And I, I will say that we will open up the stream for any Muslim responses towards the end after the presentation. We welcome any feedback, any criticism. You know, this is how we get towards truth is by the, this feedback cycle. So when no one comes up and no one's willing to defend Islam, well, that tells us something. Um, but it doesn't really tell us that our arguments are, are bad. What it tells us is that Muslims are afraid of our arguments. And I, as I said in the prayer, Anyone should be pursuing truth, and that's all we ask. So, you know, we, Mel has changed his opinion on Islamic history many times, and I'm sure he's open to change his mind again if you bring good evidence. Uh, and, you know, empty rhetoric, that's not going to do you any good. But if you have solid evidence, you have solid arguments, we'd love to hear them. Absolutely. So just to give a little bit of background, I've got three channels currently. Uh, there are two which cover the new videos, one on Rumble and one on YouTube, and the links are on display there. And then all my previous videos are backed up on Odyssey. Okay, so if you haven't uh, subscribed to any of those, please do after this, or you can do it right now. Um, I will be using um, hash words, I think that's how you call them, um, to um, 
to make it easier for people to find the videos, for example, if you want to find out about Dome, the Dome of the Rock, any videos that I produce will, will have that hash uh, name. And uh, okay, so that's just that bit out of the way. So you know where to find all the videos. And let me see. So this phrase, if it doesn't make sense, it's usually not true. This is Judge Judy uh, Scheindlin. Um, a friend of mine told me about this uh, the other day. I, I never noticed her saying this when I used to watch her, but actually her phrase is the result of years of hearing um, cases and having to sit through blatant lies. And, you know, how do you judge if someone is telling a lie? Well, you could probably look at their body language and maybe their shifty eyes, their ums, their ahs, things like that. But another obvious giveaway is the fact that their story doesn't make sense. There's contradictions in the story. Um, things don't make logical sense and that kind of thing. So I'm going to be using that as a general principle. Um, when we look at whether it be Hadith, Sirahs or whatever, anything that comes from the Islamic narrative, um, if it doesn't make sense, I would suggest it's that would suggest that it's not true. OK. Feel free to interrupt me at any stage here. So how much do Muslims believe in Islamic narratives? Now, it, um, Muslims vary, of course, but Muslims by and large believe in wholeheartedly the narratives of Islam and in its theological message. Some Muslims realizing that the Hadiths and Sirah are mostly bogus, are Quran only Muslims, but even there, they're still accepting some of the narrative, i.e. that a book was transmitted to Muhammad through an angel from Allah. So. So even if we say them at a minimum, do you know, Muslims who are Quran only, they still can't avoid depending on some of these hadiths because how else do they explain what book they have in front of them? They have some um, interpretive key to understanding the book, which is essentially a, a bunch of hadiths that they rely on, whether consciously or unconsciously, to help them make sense of the book that's in front of them. Yeah, I, th I think you often find that Muslims will say they reject something, you know, but it's more because it's embarrassing than they've come to any, you know, solid historical conclusion that this isn't true. And then they say that, but they really kind of still accept it. You know, even people who will claim to be Quranists and they only follow the Quran. Well, then they tell you about a bunch of things that they believe that are not found in the Quran, you know, I mean, you basically can't tell anything about Muhammad from the Quran and but they still say, you know, Muhammad's the messenger of God, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's not really a consistent position. You know, there are, there are plenty of Muslims, like you said, most who, who accept everything, but that's because they haven't really looked into anything. Once they start to look into things, it's, you know, I reject that, I reject this, I reject that. And then they don't, follow that through to the conclusion. They, they just reject things that are embarrassing to them as opposed to actually saying what's historically true and what isn't. Yeah, and there's also this phenomenon that I've noticed, particularly online, where even after you've disproved some point about Islam, um, come the next video, they're back stating the <laughs> same thing again, as if the discussion you've just had has never happened. It's like it's complete uh, restart um, it's a bit like starting a, a, a new game in a you know video game. You know, when you get a, a, free, a new life, you start again. So I don't understand that mentality because I think if you're honest about your discussions, if someone proves a point, you gotta accept that. You can't just say, "Well, I'll just forget what that person has just said and start asserting a false statement again." Absolutely. So in my view, you know, this may be a little bit. Um, controversial, but I think believing in the narratives places you already halfway to becoming a Muslim. Okay, so I think, and unfortunately, this is in my way, one second, believing the narratives are true, um, puts you sort of halfway. Obviously, there's parts of it that you may not accept, like, for example, that the revelation comes from from Allah. But Muslims want you to believe their stories, at the very least, if you don't believe the stories, you're over here, you know, um, but at the moment you start believing in any of the stories, you're already on your way to becoming a Muslim. You may not believe that you're on your way to become a Muslim, but it's surprising how, if you look at the story of how people converted to Islam, what normally has happened is they first delve into Islam, they read the stories, 
they start to believe the stories, they believe the stories are true, and then lo and behold, ends up becoming uh, Muslim. And now, I don't know if you recognize this woman here in the picture. I did not. It, no, it's a little um, small. She's a famous um, Irish singer called Sinead O'Connor. Um, she is a bit of, um, how, how will I say this delicately? She's got mental health issues, we'll put it that way. Um, but at one stage, she had become a priest, and then then she gave that one up, and then she became a Muslim um, without any sense of, you know, logic at all, you know. But she obviously, uh, her path that led her from one to the other would have been uh, reading the story of Muhammad, being infatuated by the story, and then slowly but surely uh, got indoctrinated with the doctrine of Islam, wasn't able to probably come up with a response to the, that doctrine uh, and therefore just imbibed it and became Muslim as a result. Yeah, you know, that's a, a really good point you have there that um, Muslims want us to take the, the historical narrative for granted because then they're already, you know, oh, oh, good ways towards Islam being true if the narrative's true. Um, you know, some critics are, say, you know, I'm just going to take the narrative for granted because there's plenty of stuff to criticize with even in the historical narrative, which is certainly true. But at the same time, you know, you're kind of giving up ground. You're saying that we're, we're accepting these things as true, at least, you know, for the purpose of argument. And then you've prevented them from having to argue for all this stuff. They've already got you halfway, like you said. Yeah, that's the thing. You've just given a lot of ground just by accepting it. Um, I would also say that even if you don't think the revelation was from God, just by accepting that the events and characters are real, you've already been successfully groomed by this ideology and primed for its later full acceptance. So, you know, <clears throat> brainwashing is not something new. It's It's been going on for centuries. Rulers have used it. They've used propaganda to get the the, the general public to believe a certain view on things and uh, this was very useful because you could get your soldiers for example to believe that um, a war is justified and you could motivate them to be willing to die for um, an ideological cause rather than for anything that's in their per personal self-interest um, so those that know what they're doing they know really how to groom people through ideology and it's a very powerful tool especially when you're trying to create an Islamic empire where the people in it don't have anything in common because they all come from different countries. And the only thing that brings them together is the ideology. And I'm very um, persuaded by the point of view that Islam is primarily a political ideology rather than a religion. I think that's something that um, our friend Lloyd de, de Young would, would argue as well. Um, so having said that, all I'm saying here really is be careful of narratives that reframe your sense of reality. You may have moral, logical or theological objections, and we have loads of those, that will ward you off from taking the last step. But there are countless cases of people getting suckered into this cult who started out skeptical. There are also cases of ex-Muslims who relapse back into Islam precisely because despite the absurdities, a part of their brain still thinks that it is grounded in reality. So that's where I'm coming at. So I'm, I'm, what I'm really saying here is just use your common sense, use your prudence. Don't get, don't get too um, suckered in by these stories. Always keep a, uh, your skeptical mind um, going, you know. By all means, I would say use Islamic sources when debating Muslims, but use them ironically not as someone who puts any credence in them. You don't actually have to believe in them in order to argue uh, with Muslims because all you're doing is you're arguing on their own premises and showing up the absurdities of, of their logic. And I think that's a good way of arguing. In fact, I would say it's much better to argue with Muslims on this ground than it is to try and argue from the um, historical critique uh, ground because it requires a lot more knowledge um, of you know what you know what actually went on historically in the seventh, eighth, and ninth century. But at at the very least, if you are going to argue using Islamic sources, 
you know, protect yourself in, against accidentally getting suckered into the ideology by keeping um, a skeptical mind about all of this. Yeah, what I, what I like to do is, um, you know, make the critique based on their sources. But then as soon as they start saying, you know, that's not true, that's not reliable, whatever, and say, well, I agree. I agree all your sources are <laughs> fake, but you need to un understand what that means. That means that your religion's based on a bunch of people who are supposedly telling lies according to you. And, and, and follow that through to its conclusion. Don't just stop and say this one thing I don't like is false. See what else is false. So, you know, start with the... Um, from their point of view, and then as soon as they start to reject things, be like, yes, I'd reject them too. I don't think they're true. But you got to keep going. You can't just stop right there and reject what you want. Absolutely. I love David Wood's line, according to Islam's most reliable sources. <laughs> That's, that phrase should be learned by every um, polemicist that argues with Islam, because um, there's so much in that. Um, if if Islam's most reliable sources are shown to be either false or absurd, what does that tell you about Islam? It obviously means that there's a massive hole in the narrative and therefore there's tons of questions to be, to be answered and, and possibly just proves that Islam is false. So I would say um, don't buy into their narratives. Um, the Hadiths and the Sirah, again I'm being controversial here, are a gateway drug into Islam. They are designed to capture your imagination to such an extent that you think they are true. When I hear some Christians trying to argue that Muhammad was just hallucinating, had a dream or was lying, I worry for them. They have already bought the bait. So it, they're arguing within within the the narrative rather than arguing from outside the narrative. So I, now they're you know you can argue within the narrative, um, but just be aware that you should always be consciously doing it ironically, not necessarily accepting it. I think the nearest would be if you if you're discussing a movie that's clearly fictional and you're you're pointing out the holes in the in the plot line. I think that's sort of the level at which you should be thinking of this, you know. Um, Islam today has got one standard sira on which it bases itself. Would you agree with that one? Um maybe. <laughs> they, they, you know, they have so many, but you're right. My, uh, current Muslims, they mostly ascribe to uh, the sacred nectar, um, the narrative found in that, which has been, you know, cleaned and and recycled and has very little to do with all of the other seras that came before it. Yeah. So I think... This is something that's relatively new to me. This is something that Lloyd has pointed out, um, and it will be something that will be pointed out later in uh, on P. Fander films. What people don't realize is there were over 50 different series, and way back in the 19th century, it was a German scholar who decided that even Hisham's Sira is going to be the standard one. He's not a Muslim, by the way. <laughs> he chose that was the one that they're going to work with, and so Islam fell in line. Um, and that was from then onwards. That was the only surah that was being referred to. Um, so that's that's quite a, a situation to be in. Um, these each have a different story about Muhammad. To what extent they're different needs to be investigated. But potentially there could be lots of contradictions and differences between the stories. The current narrative was chosen arbitrarily from amongst them. This is a rabbit hole that if we go down, will just get worse and worse for Islam's claims. And I think this would be something well worth exploring in the coming year. I'd love to um, bring on Lloyd to talk about this because I know he knows quite a lot about the Sirahs and the differences. But I, I think this would be highly embarrassing for Islam. Okay. Now, if that isn't bad enough, there are also multiple Arabic Qurans. I'm sure most of our viewers know all about that. There are 30 plus different Qurans in Arabic. In this context, does it make any sense to say the Quran was preserved, let alone perfectly preserved? It doesn't make sense. Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, well, you know, the, these lines have been crafted specifically for propaganda purposes. If they'd made a re perfectly reasonable claim that, you know, the original story is largely preserved, that it doesn't affect 
to a substantial degree, any doctrine, you know, the same kind of things that Christians say that, you know, 99% of the texts were, were pretty sure is original, then they'd be fine. But they, instead they create this propaganda. They, they create this propaganda that it's perfectly preserved right down to the letter. And then you go in the look and you're like, that's not true. And because of this propaganda, they don't have a text critical version of the Quran. So they actually don't know how much of it is corrupted. They don't know how much is uncertain. So when I say it's probably, you know, comparable to the Bible, I, I don't really know that because no one's done the text critical research because the propaganda is more important than the words of their supposed God. Yeah, I think the text critical version of the Quran is on the way, as far as I know. I think it's, um, what was it called, Corpus uh, Quranus, I think. I think it's uh, the German German well, organization, if you, do you know it? I'll just say it's about time, because every work of ancient history, even things that are only known from three manuscripts, have a, a text-critical version. Yeah, um, I know that Professor Angelica knew it in Germany. I think she's on top of, on top of that. She's working on it. I think it's Corpus Quranus, something on those lines. I, I may be wrong, but if anyone knows, you can correct me. I believe that's what it's called, but they're working on that. Um, and that's going to basically harpoon the idea that the, the Quran was perfectly preserved. And I do totally agree. If they had made a lesser claim, if they just said it's it's the gist of what was there originally, then that would be fine. But to say it's perfectly preserved is patently false. To make things worse, about 20% of the text is also unintelligible to the modern Arabic speaker. Large parts of the Quran literally, uh, that should say, don't make sense. Um, so that's another problem. And this is probably got to do with the fact that in the early days, the, the Quran was essentially a kind of a hybrid between Aramaic and Arabic, representing a local dialect of Arabic in um, either Syria or Iraq and you know the population has moved away from that particular dialect and they're left with a text that no longer makes sense um, and then there's the issue of the the, the uh, diacritical marks and where they pl place them in the text which has messed up um, the understanding of the text so you can place the dots in different locations and you have a totally different text meaning the meaning being different and so on so there's a lot of problems there with that. Um, considering that the, the narrative tells us that the Quran was given to basically um, clear up the mess from the earlier scriptures, this doesn't bode well. <laughs> you know, if this is Allah's best attempt to clear up all the corruption from the Old Testament and the New Testament, well, this is not the way to go about it. I, I would have thought that Allah would, in, in his wisdom, have waited till there was a stable language with a stable lettering system and then that would be a good time to introduce um, a, a Quran not deliver something before a, a script has been even invented properly um, it's the worst possible way of um, bringing a revelation to mankind I don't know if you want to talk on that yeah, well, you know, contrast this to the, say, the New Testament written in Koine Greek, a, a well-established language that with hundreds of texts written in the language from before the the time the the New Testament came to be, and then you get the Quran coming along, and it's it's not the literally the first work in, in written Arabic, but it, it it's while the language is still developing, well, especially while the script is still developing, and it's. A very odd choice. If this is, you know, the revelation for all humanity of all time that it's written in a language that's still evolving and, you know, a hundred years after it's written, people probably won't fully understand what was written anymore. Uh, very strange stuff. Yeah. And then and another aspect of this, which I'm not really going into today, is the fact that mm -hmm. it's not pure Arabic. It has um, got Aramaic, it's got Ethiopic and uh, Hebrew and and probably some Greek words as well. So even as an attempt to be uh, an Arabic scripture, it doesn't really achieve that. And again, if we go back to what we said at the beginning, if it doesn't make sense, it's usually not true. So I would suggest the Quran, in terms of it's supposedly being a revelation from Allah, that this is simply not true, it doesn't make sense.
The general narrative of Muhammad is so obviously false that it amazes me that anyone buys it. And we'll have a look at that in a second. Again, if it doesn't make sense, it's usually not true. We're told an illiterate man was the source of a book that has all the telltale, <laughs> telltale signs of literary sourcing. Now, that's an area that you've looked at a lot, and uh, you've done a number of videos of all of the various books and sources for the Quran. Um, does it make sense that someone who can't read or write would somehow have a book with all of these sources in it? No. Well, I mean, you can orally pass on stories. You know, this the Muslims use this as a defense. They're like, well, he was illiterate, so he must have gotten this revelation directly from God. But of course, even if we assume that he's illiterate, that, you know, you can orally pass on stories. But but the reality is Muhammad probably wasn't illiterate you know, or the, you know, whoever was the creator of the Quran probably wasn't. Even if we take the standard narrative and we, we look at um who he was supposed to be, he's a, he's a commercial trader and he, he's traveling large swaths of land, a, a trade that would normally be literate. Plus the word translated as on letter doesn't really mean that. It probably uh, Umi is the word, it probably means uh, outsider, Gentile, Gentile yeah. if you will. Uh, yeah. It probably has not, it, so this is probably a, a good example of something that developed later on in response to polemics. The, the same things that are in the Quran, you know, people accusing him of copying sources, eventually they came up with this defense. Well, he couldn't have copied sources because he was illiterate. In other words, it's totally made up. Plus, there's the, also, it's very convenient that the story is that he's illiterate because it misdirects people away from where the book likely came from, which is Iraq, Syria, you know, up in the north. By placing him down in, in Mecca as a literate man in a an obvious desert where there is no access to any of these sources. This is a brilliant defense. So the fallback then is simply, well, it could only have occurred because he got a revelation from Allah. But the obvious evidence is that there are sources being borrowed, and this is probably not just the work of one person, but a community of uh, people who are basically piecing together the, the community's scripture, as it were collectively um, and uh, even if it's done imperfectly as it actually is done imperfectly but it's certainly not the the work of someone who's who's illiterate illiterate and also in an area where these sources would not be found so i think that's you know that's a massive hole in that story and i would suggest moving muhammad north isn't enough to fix this the story of where these texts come from is complex and we need to turn to the work of Odin Lafontaine and Thomas Alexander from Inara to get the key insights. But unless Christians want to believe Muhammad got a divine revelation, then we need to stop repeating the standard Islamic narrative and learn how it really came about and what its purpose was. So I, I would say a good starting point would be to identify the sources and then um, and then kind of come to the conclusion, well, actually, we don't need a revelation to explain the book. It's, it's fully explained by just looking at the sources which are found in Syria and Iraq and so forth. Yeah, and I'll add, the, the good thing about the sources is they're hard data. The, you know, this actually um, gives us something to look at. When when you see two things that are very similar, you know that one borrowed from the other. And in many cases, we know definitively that the, the source that uh, the Quran used came well before it, so it couldn't be copying from the Quran. But this gives us some hard data. This gives us something to really look at, as opposed to, you know, just kind of looking at and trying to think in your mind, well, I think it probably worked this way. Eh. I mean, not that that's not valuable, but it's best to start with the hard data. And, and I think the source texts are probably the, the a great place to start. Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the next part that I'm going to look at is kind of like a chicken and egg type issue. Um, so just imagine in the seventh century, um, Muhammad was supposed to have told his followers that you must wear t-shirts and shorts. Okay. So, okay. Bit ridiculous. Okay. Now let's say we look at sources of how, well, let's say supposed Muslims are dressed in the eighth century. What would you expect in the eighth century if you were to assume that the hadiths about Muhammad saying that 
his followers should wear t-shirts and shorts. What would you expect? I, I would think you'd see pictures of them in t-shirts and shorts. That would be fairly logical. Um, so what we find, and there's, I, I've, I've got a few examples of this, is that we're, we have hadiths that are supposed to have originated from the seventh century, where Muhammad teaches his followers very clear things about what should be done and what shouldn't be done. And then when we look at later times, we don't see any sign that these are instructions that are even known about, let alone followed. Um, and I think that makes a very strong argument for the fact that these hadiths are literally fictions that were created later and backdated to make it look like he, he um, taught this. And this could be because at later times they wanted Muhammad's backing for some particular ideological position that they, they held and they want, they want to use him to um to make people follow that sort of uh, teaching okay so let's have a look at this here um these false narratives are immediately contradicted by historical sources according to the sin muhammad banned alcohol supposedly in the seventh century but if that were true why were why are the umayyads sending wine cups to the chinese in the eighth century now just to check that i'm not bluffing everyone watching have you heard that muhammad banned alcohol is that something i've met up or is that in the, the standard islamic narrative well that that's certainly in the standard narrative um the the quran seems to be a little ambiguous about this it seems to say that's banned but also not and, and then you you know you of course this the the muslim suggestion is that the the one that says it's not banned was earlier and that was abrogated but if we look at the early muslims perhaps they have a different opinion than current muslims yeah. So this is what um, a Chinese source has said. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, I won't read the Chinese. Um, I'll leave that to the Chinese <laughs> members of the audience. But receiving invoice, presenting golden silk woven robe, jewelry decorated jade and luxurious wine cup as tribute from the king of Dashi named Hemi Moni. Now, the key thing here is the Dashi are otherwise known as the Tayaye, um, and they ruled in Iraq, essentially. Um, so they would have been Muslims, okay? They would have been yeah, the Umayyad leaders, essentially, okay? Um, and the year that this happened was 716, 717 AD. So we're talking 100 years, supposedly, into the Islamic era. Now, the fact that the the king of the the Muslims, if we can call them Muslims, we can we, you know we can call the tribe the Tayaye, but they're supposed to be Muslims. They're sending a luxurious wine cup. Now, is that consistent with the idea that they don't drink alcohol and despise alcohol and are against alcohol? No, no, not not really. No, I think that's a clear indication that there's. A mismatch between the narrative and actually what used to go on in the 8th century. Now when I first saw this I thought well maybe this is just a one-off anomaly but really we'll f we should be finding other evidence that is consistent with the standard Islamic narrative in the 8th century but this is not what I found the more I've delved into it. So we'll, we'll look at some more examples and this is this is not exhaustive but there are you know plenty of examples we could choose from. Um, I want to just make this point before we, we go there. The messianic machine creates narratives in order to create a new religion. This is kind of an ex explainer, a primer for what's going on here. New mythologies and narratives are created whenever the existing religions reach an impasse. The old narratives no longer work, and the only way forward is a new narrative. Um, so that's my explanation for why all of these hadiths and sirahs are created. For whatever reason, the people who are who are um, directing things, the the elite, they find that they can't use the Jewish religion for their purposes. They can't use Christianity, so they need to come up with something new, with a new narrative, to fit what they're trying to achieve. And that that's the impetus behind all of this. These narratives are bundles of ideas given by people in authority, and they are trusted. People put the ideas on like new clothes and accept them on the basis of that trust. 
what matters is trust and authority, not necessarily truth. Um, because it's people in authority, they just assume, well, if they've told us these stories, they must be true. And a couple of generations pass, and then it's too late for anyone to spot that it's a lie. People open a door, walk through, and now they are in a parallel universe, divorced from reality with a fake history that forms their communal memory. And from then onwards, that is their idea of what happened previously. So back to some examples. We are also told that hadiths were collected in which Muhammad banned all images of people. I'm sure you've heard that one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's a very common one you hear said by Muslims today. You know, Muhammad um, especially doesn't want him, his own image painted, but but people people in general should not be painted. Okay. Yeah, it, it's interesting actually that they they've kind of transformed this in modern times to be just images of Muhammad. Uh, pretty much, maybe other prophets, but mostly just images of Muhammad. Uh, you know, all the all these Muslims have YouTube channels where they appear on camera and they're making images of human beings. So, they they've kind of abandoned the idea that no human being can be pictured. Yeah, unfortunately, technology has made it. Um, what's the word for it? Um, inconvenient to have a hadith like this. So this would be a hadith <laughs> that really they would have wanted to get rid of. You know, if if they had if they had a crystal ball and the new the way technology was going to go. But apparently, Sahih Muslim, volume 3, uh, number 5268, says, Ibn Umar reported Allah's messenger, having said, those who paint pictures would be punished on the day of resurrection, and it would be said to them, breathe soul into what you have created. Okay, <laughs> so that's kind of fairly black and white there. Um, if you paint pictures, you'll be punished on the day of resurrection. Um, did such an idea exist in the 7th century? Well, that's the big question. The Hadiths say that idea existed. Um, but I doubt it, considering the Caliphs of the 8th century had no reluctance about depicting people in their palaces, including naked ones. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm going to show you the evidence here. This is straight from a, a palace of a Caliph. Um, so I would suggest so what, where we're going with all of this is just, this just proves that this hadith is from a much later time um, and it's trying to um, backdate it to Muhammad's time. So let's have a look. So this is from the Kuzair Amra in the Jordan and this is from the 730s. And this is a depiction, um, I'm not sure if it's a woman or a man. Um, some people say it's a woman, some say it's a man. Uh, but bathing in a very lewd way uh, with onlookers in the background um, and certainly not something you would expect a um, hundred years after supposedly the beginning of Islam. So if, if Muhammad had said you're not allowed to paint pictures, particularly naked pictures of people, how come the caliphs are quite happy to do that just 100 years later? Now, these are the leaders of Islam. So in the 8th century, try and get your head around these. In the 8th century, supposed Muslim leaders have got people drawing pictures of naked people in their palaces. Does that make sense? It certainly does not if that hadith comes from Muhammad. Absolutely. So there's that hadith again. Um, and here's another picture from the palace. And this is in the audience hall. So it's not that this is like a private stash. This is something that would have been shown to the public. It is not conceivable that such hadiths pre-existed when the caliphs were having paintings like this done in their audience halls. This doesn't represent just what the caliphs considered culturally acceptable, but also what was tolerable for the society of the time. So you could argue, okay, there are sometimes weird caliphs that go against society and they have these anomalies, but this is in an audience hall where visitors from all over the land would have come. Um, and if, if Muhammad really had banned images of people and they were to invite the elite into these audience hall, probably what would have happened is within minutes, the caliph would have got beheaded because he's defying Muhammad, if this hadith really existed. I think this is pretty solid evidence that this hadith was not yet written in the 8th century and is purely fiction from later times.
And I'll point out that uh, this lady's face is clearly visible. So you see the later pictures, they will often draw the body, but they won't draw the face. So you can't even say, well, oh, they just didn't draw her face. I mean, you clearly see eyes and nose, mouth there. It's clearly a face. Absolutely, yeah. So they have, and there's lots of examples of this. Um, so this is utterly spurious, um, the Hadith, met up centuries later, possibly as late as the time of the Ottomans, so way later. Um, so there's your Hadith again. Yet all these clearly ahistorical Hadiths with spurious chains of narration are just spurious, are just as spurious as each other. The idea that some are sahi is just another trick to buttress what are later fabrications. So this is another little trick is they rank their hadiths, even though all of them are equally spurious and met up, <laughs> by saying that certain ones are sahi and others are daif and all the rest of it. This again is pulling the wool over our eyes and and they, they, they allow themselves um, a fallback position so that if someone really challenges a hadith as being false, they can say, well, that isn't Sahi. That's, you know, that's uh, from a, a less reliable chain of narration. And you know, it's, it's all nonsense. You know, it's um, an excuse, for, essentially, for why a Hadith um, is clearly fake. Yeah, it, it's interesting. If you look at some of the Hadith that are in, you know, not in the Sahi collections that are just in, in other works, the chain won't go all the way back to a companion. And that's probably... They probably reflect when the, the practice actually began, you know, a hundred years later or whatever. That's as far back as the, uh, the chain goes. And then later they backfilled all these other stuff to make it go back to Muhammad. So that's probably when they really started to collect these is, you know, maybe a hundred years after uh, at the earliest. Yeah, um, I would say that, that um, they were just as imaginative when it comes to their chain of narration. Um, and all of these people that they um, used um, for this chain of narration are, are um, fabricate fa um, figments of their imagination as much as as the stories themselves. These are very creative people. These people, had they lived in the twenty first century, would have been script writers for movies, and their their storylines would have been pretty good, and they would have had a good plot line, and they would have thought of every little detail. Um, but they're not perfect, and uh, when you delve into them, you soon start seeing flaws in them, which is a sign that they're simply not true. And I'll also add that, uh, you know, Muslims say, well, there's a whole science. We, we know that so-and-so had a bad memory and blah, blah, blah. Well, once a chain becomes accepted, once a particular chain is sahih, you just attach that same chain to whatever you want to be sahih and, and problem solved. Yeah. And that's exactly what most historians think happens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So another example of a hadith that has the telltale signs of a very late invention is the following. Abu Martad al Ganawi reported Allah's messenger as saying, do not pray facing towards the graves and do not sit on them. Sahih Muslim book uh, four, number 2122. Okay, so according to this hadith, you're not allowed to pray facing the grave um, and you're not allowed to sit on them. Now, this might surprise you, but I would suggest that this was invented sometime between the 14th and the 18th century AD, most likely the 18th century AD, okay? So this is, again, just more examples of uh, later fabrications, and we'll see why now in just a moment. Okay, so... Uh, before you go on, I, I wanted to read this interesting comment from Marion here. Everything that's needed to invent and create what is needed to make a society move forward is forbidden now. And that, that's actually an interesting point that, you know, like forbidding making pictures, for example, forbidding uh, innovation, bidda. It, it's kind of like the people who were creating this were like, we know what we're doing. We're, we're creating something wholesale and someone else can just do the same thing later. So let's create rules that forbid you from inventing things. Yes, they want to, they, they, they want to have the benefit of making things up, but they also want to close the door later so that it doesn't get way out of hand. They want to keep some control over this. Um, and it's it's partially because they know that once you start telling lies, um, eventually it's going to ex expose <laughs> itself, you know? Absolutely. So just to get back to what we're talking about here is that 
according to this hadith, um, Muslims are not allowed to face towards the grave or to sit on them. Um, and it's basically, it's against Islam, okay? And we're expected to believe that this comes from the time of Muhammad. Now, again, like what we mentioned about the t-shirts and shorts, if this was really something that was said by Muhammad and it was, you know, eventually written down as a hadith, we wouldn't expect any traditions of pe people visiting graves, facing them, or even praying to Muhammad in his grave or anything like that. I think that's fairly reasonable because devout Muslims would just simply not do that because if, if Muhammad said it, that's enough. It, it certainly wouldn't exist. We definitely wouldn't see it happening in prime locations in Islam, like, for example, Medina, right? If there's one place where this would not happen, if such a hadith existed, we definitely wouldn't expect it to happen at Medina. But unfortunately, that's exactly what we find, okay? Um, this is a picture from the, uh, I believe it's the, either the 19th century or maybe early part of the 20th century. So um, these are mausoleums in Medina. Um, there's big ones and small ones. And basically this was a place where Muslims used to visit and they used to pray to Muhammad and all, all the various other people supposedly buried there. Okay, and it existed for at least a thousand years. And it only got destroyed in the 19th and 20th century. Now, why you say 19th and 20th? Because it got destroyed, rebuilt, and then destroyed again. Uh, and this was due to when Wahhabism took over. And Nawawi, from the 13th century, in the section devoted to visiting Muhammad's grave, says, The visitor stands and greets the Prophet. Then he uses the Prophet as his means in his innermost self and seeks his intercession. Did you see the problem? So supposed, supposedly Muhammad said you're not allowed to face the grave, to sit on it or to visit it and all that kind of stuff. And yet here we have a practice of people praying to Muhammad. Okay. So what the, the, the takeaway here is clearly this practice existed before the Hadith was created to outlaw it. So you first, you have to have a practice in order to outlaw it. If the law is put into place through the Hadiths, then the practice would supposedly stop. But we have this practice that has occurred for a thousand years. That is not feasible if Muhammad had banned it from the start. It would just never have taken off. Now, when we look at the sequence of events, we can see when the Hadith was invented, i.e. the 18th century. So... Ibn Jubair, in 1145, 1217, he describes the beautiful mausoleums in Medina. That shows that they existed way back. Then An Nawawi, in the 13th century, describes how visitors to Muhammad's grave prayed to him, seeking his intercession before Allah. So again, both of these is evidence that there's no hadith forbidding this. Then Ibn Taymiyyah comes along in the 13th century, he denounces the visitation of Muhammad's grave. So he's the first, basically, to denounce it. Um, and his ideas are so out of whack with the rest of the Muslim population that he actually ends his days in prison for being a radical. So they don't accept his teaching. Um, it, now, if, if the Hadith had existed, he would have been fated as being someone who's supporting Muhammad's true Hadiths, but he, he, that is not what happened. He was thrown into prison and he spent his last days behind bars. Um, now, if you turn to the 18th century, 1703 to 1792, Ibn Abdul Wahhab, the, the founder of Wahhabism, he takes up Ibn Taymiyyah's ideas again and creates a movement. So where that red arrow is where I would suggest the, the beginning of that Hadith was created sometime in the 18th or possibly the 19th century in line with the beginnings of Wahhabism. In 1806, and again in 1925, following nearer reconstruction, the Wahhabis destroyed the mausoleums in Medina. Only Muhammad's grave was spared. So I would suggest that sometime between the 18th and 19th century, these Hadiths were created to um, discourage the visiting of graves. But for a thousand years, um, they, this practice had been going on.
So the Hadith must have been late, very late. Just It goes to show, again, the fakery that's going on. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, this is a really, really bold claim by you to say that a Hadith was added to Sahih Muslim in the 18th century. I mean, if you could prove this, you could... Uh, it would be devastating because this is, you know, this is one of the it, it generally considered the second best collection behind Sahih Bukhari, but certainly one of, of the the canonical collections. And you, Muslims are, could easily disprove you if they had a text critical edition. Yes. Uh, same problem with the Quran. You know, we we really don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure that there are someone somewhere kind of knows the manuscripts of the Hadith collections. But really, the, they're not readily available. The manuscript history isn't readily available. The manuscript history of the Quran isn't readily available. And this is a, this is a big red flag, right? It is, yeah. It, that, that, it, who's hiding something, you know? Uh, every other document, whether it's a, you know, a Christian text, a secular text, whatever, every document from before the time of the printing press that is of any significance whatsoever. There's text critical editions and, and scholars analyze them and they try to determine the original writing. And I, I think what, what's going to happen is if there ever is a text critical version of, of Sahih Muslim, since that's what you're talking about, they're going to find that there, not all these hadith are original. You know, they're going to have uh, First John 5, 7 situations that Muslims love to point out. Oh, someone added that text to it. Well, someone added entire hadiths to, to, to the Sahih collections. Yeah, I, I've heard that Al-Bukhari is um, the earliest full copy of Al-Bukhari is from the 19th century. So I stand corrected. <laughs> wow, even the, even the 19th century. So even when the printing press was invented, they still don't have... Uh, complete copies for another couple hundred years. Yeah, so I think if I think it would be a great question to throw back at Muslims and say, right, get, tell us when we actually have a verifiable first edition of um, Ibn Hisham or the earliest edition of Ibn Hisham, entire Sirah. Give us your earliest, um, uh, what you call, uh, Muslim Sirah or a collection of Hadiths. Give us your earliest Al-Buhari and so forth. It'd be very interesting to see what dates to come up with. Um, I would suggest an awful lot of it is fraudulent and that the dates are not accurate. Um, but the onus is on them to prove that they are as early as they claim to be. But I would suggest that um, where is heading? The evidence, I haven't seen the full evidence yet, but the evidence certainly would indicate to me that an awful lot of the Hadiths, I can't give you a percentage just yet because obviously it's, it's just... Um, these are just hints at what the truth is, but I would say the majority of the Hadiths are from Ottoman times onwards. Um, so we're not talking about um, 7th, 8th, 9th century, we're talking about way later. Um, but obviously, if Muslims want to argue with that, they're going to have to produce manuscripts from the time. Um, especially these Hadiths that I've pointed out, I'd like to see early versions of this. If these Hadiths existed, fine. But please explain to me why in Medina, no one seems to be aware of this for a thousand years. Why are the religious leaders not destroying the, these uh, mausoleums? They've been visited by millions and millions of Muslims over the centuries, probably encouraged by the imams to go and visit um, Muhammad's grave and probably considered a holy practice to do so. Um, they're not just doing this because they are uh, going against the religious leaders. They're obviously being encouraged by the religious leaders, they're told that this is a virtuous thing to do, except when Wahhab comes along in the 18th century and says, well, no, um, there's a Hadith which says the opposite. So we're going to, to destroy these um, graves, and, and they did, and it, was, it caused a huge outcry in Saudi Arabia at the time when they destroyed all of these um, graves. And they did, they did plan to destroy the grave Muhammad. And I say that with inverted commas because actually we really don't know if there was anyone in the grave or not, but the, the believed grave Muhammad was spared. Um, and that's where we have it. Okay. And, so, and I will be generous and say, you know, there is a possibility that this hadith could have been written earlier. Uh, but that tells you something different. That tells you that it wasn't considered canonical, that it wasn't considered important 
Um, so either it existed and people didn't follow it because they didn't think it was important, or it didn't exist. Either way, the standard narrative doesn't really work. Exactly. Yeah. So there's just there's um, there's not too much of a get out of jail card <laughs> that you can give for that one. I think um, if we compare early Islamic depictions of Muhammad with later ones, we see that the idea of veiling Muhammad is a later invention. Okay. How much later? It won't surprise you to know it's the 16th centuries when we see the veiling of Muhammad coming in. So the implications of this is that any hadiths that say we must not draw Muhammad's face are from that period or later. So the painting on the ground, pardon the pun, is, is an indication of what actually people did and believed. Um, and if they believe something, it's based on some form of teaching. If a, if an hadith existed, that would have formed their beliefs. And so therefore it would inform their practice. But the only time we start seeing it informing their practice is in the 16th century, which is, well, it's 900 years after Muhammad's time, which would indicate that this hadith was uh, lying low for nine centuries, if you, if you want to believe that. And then suddenly it became um, a big deal and suddenly they start failing Muhammad. So I'm just going to give you an example here. So the picture on the left is from the 11th century. Um, can you see Muhammad's face there on the Can. podium? It's quite clear, isn't it? Um, yeah, you it, can clearly see eyes and a, a mustache or something. Interesting yeah. that he has a, a mustache, uh, since Muslims generally don't want to have oh, yeah, yeah. mustaches either, but but that's beside the point. Yeah, Clearly a face there. Yeah, so this is about um, 1000 AD, so you're talking about 1020 years ago, roughly. Um, and you can see on the right, it's a bit hard to see, but basically um, over Muhammad's face, there's a veil. He looks like he's wearing those surgical masks of, uh, better not say the disease that's been out for the last couple of years. <laughs> but, uh, oops. So 16th century, Muhammad's face can't be drawn. Okay. 11th century, Muhammad's face can be drawn. So question is when did the hadith come about that says you can't draw Muhammad's face did it come before the 11th century or did it happen in the 16th century I would suggest the paintings would indicate it started to um, be published in the 16th century because it was written in the 16th century and of course this is when the Ottomans were really growing in power and and they're, they're becoming more and more because they're becoming more and more powerful their religion is becoming more and more extreme um, and one sign of that was the fact that Muhammad Muhammad's face is veiled okay um, you'll also notice that there are flames coming out of Muhammad can you see that the golden flames yeah yeah um, we have a related question here from De Jordan that asks is that a halo and on the 11th century one it does appear to be a traditional halo and then the later one it's replaced by flames of fire which is the traditional the now traditional way to draw uh, the equivalent of a halo yeah so i, I would into, i would suggest that in the uh, 11th century the the depiction of muhammad is based on byzantine uh, ideas of saints so they would, would have drawn um halos the the one on the right would have been um influenced by Buddhist art, which is quite quite a remarkable source to base your um, artwork. If, if you are trying to um, promote a religion that is not pagan, and you are turning to what many would consider a pagan religion, Buddhism, okay? Um, I think in some forms of Buddhism, they don't even believe in a god. I know there are some forms of Buddhism that does, but that's a very strange source to go to to get the you know this form of depiction okay now another example of what we're talking about this again is quite controversial um, there's a reference in 870 to a saracen synagogue now this clashes with our notions of early islam the traveler Bernard the monk visited the holy city around 870 AD and wrote that the temple of Solomon, 
is in the north, which houses a Saracen synagogue. Now, monks are pretty knowledgeable about religious matters, and this has often been written off as a mistake. You know, Saracen means Arab or Muslim. Why did he call it a synagogue? Why didn't he call it a mosque? Um, but maybe he saw something about early Islam that indicated that it was a Jewish um, sect of some kind rather than it being um, a completely new religion at this stage. This is, as I say, 870 AD. Note that there is no Dome of the Rock as the Dome of the Rock would be in the center of the Temple Mount. So he's not saying that it is in the center. The Temple Mount would be in the center, not in the north. So if you look in the picture there where the red box is, a, re a red rectangle, that's where he says that the Temple of Solomon, which is equated with the Dome of the Rock, that's where he says it is. It should He should have said it's in the center. Okay. That he calls it a synagogue is not a mistake. He is a monk, not a lay person, untrained in religious matters. This clashes with the standard narrative of how Islam began. Um, most people believe that the Dome of the Rock was built by Abdul al Malik in 692. And yet, we have a witness here who doesn't seem to notice a Dome of the Rock in existence in 870 AD, which is nearly two centuries later. So that would indicate that there's something seriously amiss. Okay. Now, sometime between 870 and 897, a Dome of the Rock was built, and hey, presto, a narrative is created first. So I, I don't know if you've seen Star Wars, but it's basically a mind trick. They basically wave their fingers and say, this is ancient, go about your business. <laughs> there's nothing to see here. You know? And it worked. <laughs> the amazing thing is, the narrative was told, the the Dome of the Rock, at the time that they wrote this narrative, would have only been about 20 years old at most. People just fell in line. They just, well, well, it doesn't make any sense, but okay, fine. Um, and then within a few generations, it just became this part of, of the general standard narrative. So here is what was said. Okay, so just try and imagine that this is, 28 years after this monk visited the Temple Mount, he tells us that there was a Temple of Solomon in the northern part. He says nothing about there being a dome in the central part. Um, but here we have in the late 9th century, the Sunni historian and geographer Yakubi, who died in 897. And he reported in a way that is suggestive of the building having stood long enough to leave room for interpretation. But I, you can all read that for yourselves. But the key bit is that it says then Abdul al Malik built above the Sakra a dome. Now the Sakra is the the rock that is underneath the Dome of the Rock. It's it's the rock that's referred to when we talk about the Dome of the Rock. Um, it is the place that was believed to be where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. So a very important place for Jewish people. And yet this is our very first. Uh, reference to a dome of the rock being built and it's as you can see it's very late it's the ninth century whereas literally only 28 years before that we have a christian monk who visits the temple mount and just says no there's just a building in the northern part nothing else and it's a saracen synagogue can you see you can see what the problem is with all of this it means that there's massive holes in the standard Islamic narrative. And what we can see here is the beginnings of a cover story that's backdated with, it's very convincing because it's got all the names and so on, and it's got all of the circumstances around it. it looks very convincing, except the fact is earlier witnesses didn't seem to see any of this, okay? We can be reasonably confident that at the time of 897, there was a dome. But in Abdul al Malik's time, I would suggest not. All we can say is that a monk reported there being a Saracen synagogue in a different location. No mention of a dome, no mention of it being over the rock. He specifies that it is in the north so that it cannot have been over the rock. Sadly, lies are readily accepted and fact checking are rare. But there is an inscription that says it is in the dome. Sorry, I'll say that again. But there is an inscription that says it in the Dome of the Rock. 
Are you familiar with the idea that there's an inscription that says that Abdul Al Malik built the Dome of the Rock? Yes, and uh, I did watch your your recent video on this, so I know where you're going to go, but I won't give it away for the audience. Okay, okay. <laughs> so our first verified witness to an inscription pertaining to who built the Dome of the Rock is actually again from the 16th century. You've seen a pattern here. How late all of these things are turning out to be. But even that didn't say Abdul Al Malik, but Umar. So this is something that's it's new. Um, I haven't heard this until this year, and uh, we have a, a witness account of this inscription, thankfully, from the 16th century. So we know that this inscription did exist, but it no longer exists. Okay? Um, and this is the inscription. It references Umar, um, and it's given in A.J. Juice's paper, The Jewish Serpent King. And if people want to um, have a look at that paper, it's I highly recommend it. It's quite a long paper. Um, you can download that from Academia uh, for free. Okay, so uh, do you happen to do you happen to know what that uh, inscription was written in? It looks like the text on the reverse side is probably not in Arabic. So I'm guessing that this was maybe a tourist or something that went there and recorded the. the yeah, um, yeah, I have no idea. I don't know the full ins and outs. I think um, that would be probably worth inquiring into. It looks like it's a different type of script underneath. So pre presumably the person who who transcribed what they could see in the script and wrote it on top of. Well, I, I think that's probably the reverse side of the paper coming through, because if you look, it awesome. looks like it goes the opposite direction. Um, yeah, yeah. Could but in right. any case, it's definitely not. It doesn't seem to be Arabic, so they, it seems to be a yeah. different text. Yeah, at a guess, I would. Well, it, it could be possibly Latin, maybe. But yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe German. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, okay, hey, but that's... no problem. If you don't know, you know, we can just look into it later. But yeah, yeah, it'd be, it'd be worth looking into it. But I suppose like the key takeaway is that we have Umar's name mentioned instead of Abdul Al Malik. Okay, so to summarize the additions that have occurred with the the reference to who built the Dome of the Rock, it's a bit like who killed. Um, uh, what's his name from, I don't know, do you remember the sitcom called Dallas? Mm. Uh, J.R. Ewing? There was a character um, who killed J.R. Ewing. It was a bit like that. Who built the Dome of the Rock here? Um, for centuries, um, different people, both Muslims and non-Muslims, um, suggested different people who built the Dome of the Rock. There was no clarity about it. Some said it was Walid. Some said it was... Uh, uh, Umar, some said it was Abdul al Malik, some said it was al Mamun. Um, and so these inscriptions were basically trying to nail down officially who it was. Um, and they were trying to probably get rid of the arguments around this question. But so, summary then first, Umar was claimed as the builder of the Dome of the Rock by an inscription, no less. And this was done in the 16th century. Secondly, Abdul al Malik was claimed again as the builder of the Dome of the Rock, and this inscription was done in the 18th century. And thirdly, Al Mamun was claimed as the builder of the Dome of the Rock, though the year 72 AH was retained from the second edition. In other words, they left the uh, anomaly between Abdul al Malik and Al Mamun. It's kind of like these, they split their bet between the <laughs> two. Um, and this. Uh, inscription was created in the 19th century so that's like just so recently um and interestingly an archaeologist who visited the dome of the rock uh noticed the anomaly between al mamun and, and abdul al malik and thought there was something up with that and that happened in the 19th century so it's interesting literally within decades of this inscription being in place uh, an archaeologist spotted the anomaly Okay, so it's kind of worked, but yeah, it raised a lot of eyebrows and a lot of questions. So um, to try and tie it together, I think I'm going to use an IT analogy here to explain all of this. Islam is in danger of crashing and needs a complete reboot. Islam's narratives are changed at will in an iterative process akin to what occurs in software development. Bugs are found, then corrected, but these lead to further contradictions. And this has been the, the age-old problem.
The problem is that is, it, Islam's operating system is built on DOS, when really it wants to start afresh with a completely new operating system so that it can finally free itself from legacy software holding it back. I hope people can follow this software analogy. Shia Islam went through 12 Imams, which were meant to reboot it, but failed. And the, the 12th Imam went into um, occultation and is believed to return in the future to, to tie up all the loose ends. Sunni Islam um, hopes that its Sharia law would provide a comprehensive antivirus package, but that too is out of date. Islam is banking on a Mahdi operating system to save the day, the Mahdi being the, the Messiah who would basically waltz in and just make it all make sense. Okay, But I would say if it doesn't make sense, it's usually not true. So there I leave it. Excellent. Uh, I did post the link for any Muslim who wants to come up and chat with us. I do have a few questions for you. Um, feel free to say you don't, you don't know or, or okay. you don't have an opinion or whatever, because they're not directly related, uh, just yeah. tangentially related. So uh, you mentioned uh, so, uh, you, you mentioned that the Dome of the Rock was called, uh, or not really the Dome of the Rock, but the building there was called a, a synagogue. And uh, this would be compatible with, with my current line of thinking that Islam probably started as a pseudo-Jewish sect. Um, and I think this primarily because most of the source texts of the Quran are Jewish texts, and not just ones that would be readily available, but the kind that would only probably be read by rabbis. So what are your thoughts uh, on that possibility that it derives from Judaism? Yeah, I think there's a very strong case for that. Um, Red Judaism would argue that case as well. Um, they obviously use um, Christian lectionaries in terms of uh, what they were doing in those early days, but there seems to be a hybrid situation going on. But I would say it's probably, it's hard to it's come down to one side or the other, but it seems to be primarily a Jewish phenomenon. Um, and I think the the monk that visited the Temple Mount could see that, obviously, in, in terms of the layout of the building and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I would I would go along with that. And, and when would you say that something resembling modern Islam started to develop? Would that be with the Abbasids or would that be at a different point in time? Um, my current view is really you're, you're seeing um, what we what looks very like Islam today, I think we're talking about Ottoman times. That's quite, that's quite a big jump. Um, however, if you go back to the 8th century, the 9th century, the 10th century, you are definitely seeing the early elements of it. Um, but a lot of the practices were very similar to what Christians and Jews were doing, like, for example, visiting graves. Um, Catholics um, would have gone to graves, they would have prayed to saints and you can see that the muslims were doing exactly the same thing the way that muslims were praying by um prostrating on the floor that was a practice that was done by uh, christians so they obviously have borrowed that so, so the, there was a lot of things that were similar um the other thing is we can see that they were comfortable with alcohol at least up to the early part of the eighth century um and then they they started to prohibit alcohol um, probably around the time of the Abbasids. They started going a bit more extreme. Um, and why that was the case, they probably needed a really strong identity. Um, they're gradually trying to distance themselves from um, Judaism and Christianity. They, they need a reason why someone should become what they are that's different from mm -hmm. Christian and, and different from um, from Jewish uh, Judaism. So I think sort of the middle of the eighth century, I think they're 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 heading towards it becoming very very different to what was there before. And I was I was reading a book called The Myth of Andalusia recently, and when you look at the the reports from the say the late eighth and the late eighth century and then the ninth and tenth century in terms of the the practices of the those muslims whether those were um if you like 
heretical anti-Trinitarian group and not necessarily Islam per se at that stage, but they had really kind of extreme practices even then. So we, we it's just kind of, it's, it's very hard really to, to put your, your post in the ground and say, this is when Islam began. And when it's a bit like you're looking, you're looking at it different stages of an embryo and you're saying, well, when does, when does the embryo look human now? It, well, you say, well, it's got a heartbeat there. It's kind of, you know, it's that kind of thing. You know, I can see a skeleton now. It, now it's, it's there. It's a bit like that. So, yeah, yeah. To, to draw a, a different analogy, you know, there's considerable debate on when there was a hard break between Judaism and, and Christianity, and that's with a lot of you know data behind yeah, it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of sources to look at, and and different people will say the break occurred here or it occurred there. Um, so even with you know hard data to look at, it, it's not always clear when the when the break occurred. So I think that's a fair answer. Then yeah. We don't really know. It, it probably happened gradually over time. And I think that's actually the probably the most important takeaway from this is that Islam has continued to evolve. It, it, it was evolving from the time that it was really not Islam at all. There was, you know, some sort of ecumenal or, or Jewish movement. And it evolved a little at a time over long periods of time. And that didn't stop. It didn't stop with the Abbasids. It, it didn't stop with the biography of Ibn Ashaq or, or whenever. It's continued up to the present day to the point where um, Muslims will look at that when we read their own, you know, highly trusted sources to them. They're like, that's not part of Islam. What, what are you talking about? Because it's continued to evolve. Yeah, I would say if let's say you were to take a, a we'll call a Muslim from the, eight, the early 8th century. And if you were to time travel them to today and show them Islam today, they would not recognize it as the same religion. They would say, what is this monstrosity um, <laughs> of a religion? They would say, "Where? how did they get so far removed from what we believe in in the early 8th century? It's like they, There was a reason why Muslims saw themselves as more or less like Christians and Jews in the early days, because they were very similar. They weren't so different. Now they've become so different that it's it's even hard to imagine that they've come from from there originally. But they were much more similar. So it's kind of like they've moved apart over the centuries, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, I just had an interesting thought. So this is off the top of my head, but I'll see what your opinion is. So there's the the hadith that Muhammad said, supposedly says that the first three generations of Muslims are the only pure ones, the best ones. However, you want to phrase that, and that was you know, almost certainly very well after three generations. So would you say that that's an attempt to change what the beliefs of that time were, that they're saying yeah, we've become, our beliefs have become corrupted, so we've got to go back to this stuff that we just made up? Um, yeah, there's, there, there's obviously an attempt to continuously in Islam to create cover stories for things that stand out like a sore thumb. So... They want to explain why are there innovations so they can say, well, you know, in the early days, things were pure. So that's that would be one exp explanation. Or if they want to introduce something new, but that's not currently been done. Well, they can say, well, we need to go back to the pure days. And Muhammad said this way back when. Um, so, OK, people didn't know about the city, but no, he really did say we have this li line of narration so they can basically introduce a hadith at will, and then allow that to become a new innovation without people thinking it's an innovation because actually, no, 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 this comes from the seventh century. So we're actually just going back to the way it originally was. But who's going to argue with that? If your religious leaders tell you that and the Sharia law says that you must obey, you must not question your religious leaders, then it just becomes taken as fact and then the reset button has been hit and there away you go you know yeah that's actually a really good point that you know the first reaction to someone it would including someone like me would probably be like i i don't think that they really could have added things so late surely people would have noticed but then you realize that the number of people who actually are familiar with with you know from ancient times and maybe it's a little broader now but number of people who are actually directly familiar with what the Hadith collections say is, you know, very, very tiny. And Islam's created this system where you're just supposed to follow the leader unquestionably. You're not supposed to think for yourself. And 
that probably is pretty ancient. I mean, that's even in the Quran, right? Yeah. But if you take Ibn Taymiyyah, right? Um, I think it was, I'm, I'm trying to remember, 14th century, I'm going to say. I think it was from the 14th century. Um, when he came out with his views in the 14th century, he was viewed as an out-and-out -out heretic, a dangerous man. But pretty much all his views becomes the standard uh, Islamic theology centuries later. So there in itself just tells you how much Islam has got away from what it was like in the early days. So he, his views were so out of whack with the rest of Islam in the 14th century, they thought it was appropriate to throw him into prison for the rest of his life. It's only that the fact that Wahhab took up his ideas centuries later, that that took off. And then Saudi Arabia then spent billions propagating this form of Islam, and that became the standard form of Islam in many countries around the world. Whereas prior to that, Islam had been a relatively, you know, moderate religion. But then it went off on a an extreme line for for decades, and it's only really in the last ten years that um, Saudi Arabia has tried to draw that back in and say, you know. This is sort of untenable. We can't keep going like this. Um, we'd like some tourists coming to our country. We need to drop the, the Wahhabi line and just um, get back to something where we can um, we can keep our people happy and actually make money. You know, so there's a lot of that going on. The, the all powerful dollar there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so switching gears a little bit, um, of course, there's also the military conquests going on. How would you tie those? in with the religion are they independent and later tied in later sources or uh are the do the military conquests come first and then they need a justification for what they've already done or how would you view that yeah it's good it's a good question um i suppose one thing you have to you have to admit really in, if you're talking about the conquests in the seventh century a large number of the people who were taking part of in the conquests the, amongst amongst the arabs were christians that's something that's overlooked. Um, whatever was there, whatever sect existed in the seventh century, they would have been the minority. Um, and if the, if they didn't have the Christian majority on board with that, um, they would have never succeeded because they were just outnumbered. Okay, so um, so what was driving them? Well, what was driving them is the fact that they were snuggled between the Byzantines and the Persians. Right, and they're getting really ticked off between the wars that were going on between both sides, and they are the buffer zone, and so they had a very strong political um, incentive to basically to fight against both, and basically win their independence. And religion doesn't really pay, play much of a role. Um, people would have taken advantage of this uh, military conquest and put religious meaning onto it, which is always something that happens. If we take the situation with Russia and the Ukraine, the Orthodox leader, um, Kirill, is, is providing religious defense for the, the military conquest of the Ukraine. That's always kind of religion, unfortunately, plays a part in a lot of these things, it, because without that, um, without a religious ideology, it's very hard to motivate people to to risk their lives for something. The people will rarely risk their lives for um, for the sake of something that doesn't per particularly affect them, their own family. But if you can create a, an ideological um, construct, narrative, whatever, then you could motivate people to get involved in a war and risk their lives for, for a bigger cause. Um, so that's where the religion thing came, came in. But I think the evidence on the ground in the seventh century is the coins have crosses on them. Um, and so we're talking about in all the places that you'd expect there to be references to Islam, we we see crosses and it's only, um, I think it's the, the six eighties is when you see the first reference to a Shahada. Um, and then you have obviously more clear references to what looks like Islam in Abdul al Malik's time. Um, but for decades there, you, you'd be hard pressed to say this was Islam happening on the ground. There's very little evidence. Um, but that's not to say there wasn't some sect that, that is arguing for some form of um, hybrid between Judaism and Christianity where 
Jesus is presented as um, something less than divine, some form of servant of God. Um, but that's a long way short of Islam. But it's you can see how that could be the, the nucleus of what developed later. Uh, very good. I will add that there's at least one coin with uh, Jewish symbolism on it that also has the Shahada printed on it. Right. Oh, wow. Uh, so uh, another question I have for you is, do you know when the earliest reference to the AH dating system uh, began or comes from? Yeah, I can't remember offhand. I remember discussing that about two, maybe two and a half years ago. And I would have to a look lo at long time ago. <laughs> long time ago, yeah. So I, I would have to, I would have to look that up. But basically, from memory, um, the earliest inscriptions would have had originally said in the year of the Arab. Um, it wouldn't have been in the year of the Hijra. The year of the Hijra came in. Um, it wouldn't have come in within the first century. We were talking about at least a century, if not later. But I maybe. I may be wrong on that because obviously it's a long time ago, but essentially for the first few decades, there's no reference to the Hijra. That's a later uh, invention. So you see the year of the Arab. Again, that kind of fits in with what I've just said about the fact that it's primarily a, a political thing. Um, so it's about Arab independence from the Byzantines and the, the Persians. Uh, so then would 622 be the founding of the political movement? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, it um, now there's there's dispute about when exactly it started. There there is actually a reference to six eighteen as uh, let me just make sure that's right. I right. like see the six seventeen six eighteen as well um, in um, some some narratives around that. So now that the 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 mismatch between six eighteen and six twenty two might be to do with the the um, the type of year that's been used, whether it's a lunar year or solar year. And so maybe it just matches up and it's the same year started. But um, I think it's got to do with the the beginning of the rebellion um, by the Arabs. They basically, they, they, fought, they fought against the Persians and the Byzantines and that marked the beginning of that independence. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, if the audience has any questions, please put those in the chat. And reminder, I did put up the link if someone wants to join us live. But if no questions come up in the next couple minutes, this will, I think, will be my last question. Okay. And that's, uh, so there's a number of historical non-Islamic sources that also talk about this period of time. Uh, the earliest ones don't mention a figure named Muhammad, but they do seem to think that there's a, a new religious movement starting. And then the later add in the, the name Muhammad, but they kind of have the same message. So my question to you is, how would you tie in these non-Islamic history sources with what you've suggested today? Yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a mess, <laughs> to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, the narrative is very confused, and I haven't really got to the full bottom of it. Um, I've looked into Chinese sources, and in the Chinese sources, it's, it basically uh, suggests that there was a leader of the Taiyaye in Iraq who was responsible for that rebellion that we spoke about, whether it be 622, 618. Um, heard me. Um, there is a reference in 634 to uh, the Taiyaye of Muhammad. Okay, so that's our earliest one. The problem is that according to the standard Islamic narrative, Muhammad died two years before. But in this reference, which is given by Thomas the Presbyter, uh, Muhammad seems to be just starting his mission. He's fighting east of uh, Gaza. Now, the the word Muhammad in that context is, is confused. Um, some would say that it refers to a person. Um, some would say that it's a group. Um, Muhammad may refer to the Temple Mount. So there's lots of possibilities. I, I do think it probably refers to a person myself. But the interesting thing, it's not the, the Quraysh uh, of Muhammad. It's referring to the Tayyaye of Muhammad. So that there is another mismatch. Um, but it, it would seem to me that the, the, the person who started the rebellion um, back in 622, and the person who's um, invading um, um, Israel or Palestine 
it's probably not the same person because there's loads of narratives that basically have a, a group of people, the, the Rashidun figures. Um, and uh, the problem is we, I cannot get those people to match up. There's something wrong with, with, the, with the, the dating. Um, Red Judaism has suggested that the person referred to as Muhammad in that uh, context might be Umar. And I think that's a very um, compelling case um but what's interesting is that from umar onwards it doesn't appear to be that these are islamic figures they may have been from a hybrid sect but the fact that they're when they do start printing coins or stamping coins whatever they have crosses which is not what you'd expect if if um is if islam is saying that muhammad was against christianity and against the cross that's the last thing you would expect so that just shows you how much of the narrative is bogus and uh you know the title today was the fact that this is islam is fake and that that's what the evidence tells you but um yeah, I think yeah actually that's a, another good example of a hadith that couldn't possibly come from muhammad right there's there's several hadith about jesus coming back and breaking the cross and and, yeah. and so forth you know specifically saying the cross is a forbidden symbol and yet we have i don't know 50 70 years of is presumed Islamic coins that have cross symbols on them. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah. we did have one question from Coco yeah. here. Do you have any idea how Kabbalah and Kaaba of Allah could be linked? It sounds so similar, but um, where could the link be? So I, I, I would I would caution against thinking that just because something sounds so, yeah, similar yeah. that they're related. Uh, but do you have any more specific information about that? No, I don't think there's any link. Um, I think it's just it's one of those things that maybe the etymology might have some similarities, but I don't think there's any direct link there. Yeah, I would say that in the, the theory that um, Islam evolved out of a, Jew, a pseudo Jewish sect, uh, it probably was related to mysticism, but uh, the Kapala mysticism comes later and it hadn't really developed yet in the 8th century yeah i don't know too much about that i think um colin would be the person yeah, to ask yeah. about that he knows <laughs> a lot about that but yeah i wouldn't be surprised if that's something that's brought in much later into it i suppose something i could have uh brought up in relation to that that jewish link is the fact that um if we take two places in mecca uh safa and marwa if we look to Jerusalem, what do we find? Well, we find that Mount Moriah, where the Temple Mount is, if you pronounce Moriah in Hebrew, in its Arabic form, what you get, you get Mount Marwa. So there's your Marwa. And then if we looked across to Mount Scopus, well, it's, it's alternatively referred to as Safa, as far back as 2,000 years ago. So we have Jewish links even in the, the monuments in Mecca that are, are uh, linked there. So there, that again indicates a Jewish origin. Uh, Villainous said he had a question earlier. I have not been able to find that scrolling up. So if you could if repeat you that, please. Repeat but in, question, yeah. in the meantime, we do have an off topic uh, question. Um, do you expect apostasy to reach 50% in the West within our lifetime? Um, can you be more specific? Do you mean apostasy among Christians or? Uh, well, I would assume Islam's. he means among Muslims. Muslims. I think it's probably reached fifty percent among Christians, but um, I would say that and higher. I think it could be really like off the cliff stuff. You could be talking seventy-five percent and higher. Yeah, my, my I, I would agree. See, the problem. If, we have a couple um, reasons to believe that. You know, we, we tend to think that people don't change their religious beliefs and, and it's really hard for someone to apostatize. But uh, I would I would point to two things. I, I'd point one to the 18th and 19th century developments in, in Christianity, where these scholar, scholarly views uh, started to filter down to the public. And even though they really shouldn't have been damaging to Christianity, it, it caused massive doubt yeah. among the population and now Christians have good answers for this but the church wasn't prepared this all new information so for a period of time uh, you know people were really in this area where where it seemed like Christianity was falling apart 
and a lot of people left the church at that time. Um, and I think that's what's happening right now with Islam. This is the yeah. first time in history that these scholarly ideas are, are starting to filter down to the public, and people are seeing that, that what they believe isn't really matching up with reality. And I don't think there's any answers. I don't think that no matter how much research you do into Islam, you're ever going to come up with any good answers. Yeah. And then I... I, I, I Go ahead. I, I would just add to that that I think one of the, the, the key things in the 19th century as well, on top of what you said, is that there were um, new narratives that better explain things for Christians, like, for example, the theory of evolution. Um, um, and so that made perfect sense. It was nice and simple, easy to understand, or, you know, even though people probably had a child's understanding of it, but it's, it's, it kind of made ready sense. So it wasn't just cold hard facts it was actually a story that could be told that you could hear and you go oh right so we evolved from this okay and then they looked at the biblical story and they, they couldn't tie the two things together so one of those two propositions had to go now i think what we're not very good at in dealing with islam is we're not very good at offering a counter narrative we've be giving them little bits of facts and and making them question things but I think where it will get really exciting is when we actually offer a coherent counter narrative. We're very close to that. Um, and I've kind of been hesitant about coming forward too much with a narrative because I think the danger is that you, you, you go a bit too fast and then have to correct your narrative in light of new evidence. But we're getting very close. The sin sifters that I, that the group that I'm a member of, there's, um, I think there's about seven or eight of us all together. We're all working at this from different angles and sometimes we disagree with each other, but there's a kind of a core part of what we're all concluding on that seems to be well-founded. And eventually we're going to come to uh, an agreed narrative about how Islam began. And uh, I think once that's in place, um, I think that will be a very damaging thing for Islam because um, ordinary Muslims, when they hear the narrative, they will just readily get it and the penny will drop. It just has to, they just need to, it's very, a very human part of, of, of our nature that we live by stories. If we get a clear story that explains something, that's when the penny drops and um, you, you don't survive the story. If the story makes sense, you know, the, the old story that does no longer make sense will be dropped, which, you know, that's what I think will happen. Yeah, excellent point there, that as long as we're just pointing things out that are problems and not offering something to replace it, it's kind of like, well, I, I see the problems, but I don't have a better alternative, right? So, so maybe Islam is still true and, and you're just not seeing things right. I, I think you're right. Once we have that, you know, comprehensive alternate story about how the, all these things came to be that's when people will really start to be like yeah this doesn't hold up to scrutiny yeah um, so closed oh go ahead i was just going to say that um one group that's really uh, making headways in that whole area is the inara group in germany um and dr robert kerr is the leader of that and uh, i can i think i'm free to say that we'll be seeing more of him soon on, on, on many YouTube channels. Um, so look out for him. He's going to be coming on board. He loves what we're doing. He's very much in, in favor, even though we're the amateurs, but there we've, um, I think we've encouraged a lot of the academics to come out of the woodwork and actually come on and make videos and share their knowledge because an awful lot of their knowledge is hidden away in papers that no one ever reads. You know. Yeah, and I think that what we're also doing is showing that you can talk about these things in public without risking your, your lives. And, um, you know, that's just another example of the Islamic political dominance that they've created this idea that merely talking about facts uh, it could be dangerous. So there's this hesitancy from people doing this research to actually make it well known in public. So we'll close out with this question from uh, Villainess. Do we have much Christian documentation from the Spanish Umayyad period to get a third party view. Um, we do and we don't. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is an awful lot was destroyed in the conquest of Spain. So 
they were lucky to even to have uh, any of their churches still standing from that time. So if you imagine relics, churches, you name it, and Christians were all um, killed and destroyed and damaged and so on. So a lot has been destroyed. There is um, a chronicle from, I'm going to say the 750s. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Um, I've gone, you know, um, I, no, I can't remember the name of it offhand, but um, it it gives a, a certain version of events which um, at, explains some of it, but it doesn't. It's not comprehensive enough, in my view. But um, I think we we're, we don't have as n enough evidence or as much evidence as we would like. We'd always like more, and there's a good chance there's an awful lot of evidence that's hidden away in documents somewhere that haven't been translated. So I'm hoping on that. Yeah, and we're also working against uh, the Islamic texts that encouraged people to destroy non-Islamic yeah. writings as well. Yeah. yeah. So thank you all for joining us today. I think this was a, a great stream, very informative. If you'd like to learn more about early Islam, be sure to subscribe to Origins. A link to that is in the video description. Uh, I'll have him on again at some point. Um, you know, he's a very busy guy. Hard to get him on here sometimes, but I, I would definitely like to have him on to update his research periodically. A couple previous streams uh, with him on this channel, and if you look at those, you're going to see something very different because, like I yeah. said, he's open to change his ideas, open to change his mind. So if any Muslims who, who watch this later, they have some evidence that we should be considering, please put it in the chat. If you just have empty rhetoric, don't waste our time. Have a great week, everyone. Uh, I'll be live again in an hour in 20 minutes, so tune in for that. God bless.